Hello and welcome to Jack's Corner. I'm Tarzan Bonanno, and here we have our founder, Jack Figgle. Uh, we're going to sit down with in the next couple weeks and go over, well, how all this began. So, Jack, how you doing? Good, Tarzan. Good to see you today. Good to see you as well. Um, so... We've uh, started the podcast. It's been a couple weeks. I uh, figure it's time for us to show the people who's behind it, right? So, yeah, if that's what you you think makes makes it gonna uh, go go better, happy to do it. Absolutely. So, uh, Jack, how did how did this all start? Where 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 uh, where does it begin for you? <laughs> well, how far back do you want to go? Um, I, I would say I'll just briefly mention the fact that I was born and raised as a Byzantine Greek Catholic, uh, in a steel mill suburb of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, all four of my grandparents came from Eastern Slovakia, uh, and emigrated either at the turn of the last century, uh, namely the turn of the 19th to 20th century, or uh, early in the century, uh, just before World War I. Um, and back in those days, it was the Austro-Hungarian Empire that, that they were uh, emigrating from. And there was a huge migration uh, at that time of Greek Catholics from a very concentrated area of the empire uh, that is uh, within what's called the Carpathian Mountains. The Carpathian Mountains is a mountain range that separates uh, Poland uh, and Ukraine from Hungary and Romania. Uh, and right in the middle of it is what is known as um, Ruthenia. A lot of people ask me, you know, we call ourselves the Ruthenian Catholic Church. And they ask me, where is Ruthenia? Well, Ruthenia only existed for the period between World War I and World War II as a subsection of Czechoslovakia. Uh, and uh, it was uh, never uh, a major power. Certainly, it was even not even a minor power. It was just a, a region within Czechoslovakia. And, and when they split up the old Austro-Hungarian Empire after World War I, it made it all the little countries throughout Eastern Europe and the Balkans. Um, the uh, immigration took place between the 1890s into the early 2000, uh, 1900s, and all four of my grandparents settled in coal mines near Pittsburgh. My grandfather started as coal miners and then moved to Duquesne, Pennsylvania, um, to work in the U.S. steel mills there in the 20s. So your second they, generation? Uh, so I'm a uh, second generation. Yep. So my parents were born in Duquesne. They were high school sweethearts. Uh, my uh, father's older sister used to babysit my mother. They lived around the corner from each other. So my parents have known themselves their whole lives since they were kids. Um, belonged to the same Greek Catholic Church, Saints Peter and Paul in Duquesne. I was born, raised there graduated high school, was in charge of the altar servers, and, you know, was active in all sorts of things with church life. Uh, went away to college, and I couldn't find a Byzantine Catholic church within 100 miles of the University of Rochester in upstate New York. And so I tried to academically understand who I was and where I came from, uh, because I couldn't find anybody else like me. I, I even had uh, sort of... Uh, you know, um, dreams of that I belong to my own religion. There, um, but after that, after I got out of college and after I learned more about the Byzantine Empire, because the Byzantine Empire was never studied in high school. You know, I, I grown up as kids, we never heard of it. So what was this Byzantine Catholic stuff? And Eastern Europe, hardly anything was known. So I did my own research. Uh, and when I got to college at the Newman community, which was a parish of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Rochester, um, I 
tried to bring as much Eastern content into the parish life as I could. In fact, I brought a, a, a Byzantine Ruthenian priest from Harrisburg, the closest parish, and we had our own divine liturgy uh, on campus as a special event uh, once a year. Uh, once a year. And I, that was my, that was my debut as a cantor. I led the singing uh, myself because I had no other cantor. So, one, it's so that's, one of the... that's how I that all got started was I grew up with it. Yeah. Yeah, with uh, one thing we have in common being, uh, no, I'm from originally Rochester, New York, uh, no longer there. But, and you're saying that there was no Byzantine, no Eastern Catholic influence at all within Rochester. So I'm so, going. There was, yeah, there was one Ukrainian Catholic church up on the shore, um, and so you had to have a car to get there. Uh, there's no bus or anything way up on the lake shore um, north of the city Uh, and uh, you know back in the 70s when I was going to school there it's still a little bit to this uh, extent now but not as bad Um, if you didn't speak Ukrainian you were you were sort of shown the door Uh, you'd walk in not knowing Ukrainian and and they'd ask well why are you coming here I, I try to explain I, I wanted to come in, you know, Ukrainian liturgy was pretty close to the church Salonic I grew up with, um, but I, I wasn't, I didn't feel welcome and it was complicated to get there. So I just, uh, you know, learned more about the Roman church by going to mass. And back in the seventies after Vatican II, we were into guitar mass. Uh, you know, everything was a guitar mass. Everything was folk mass. Uh, and uh, I even, um, uh, my thing is, my junior year went to daily mass, which was sitting around a coffee table on the floor, uh, talking about scripture with the priest and the nun who were the chaplains. And the sermon was, you know, a discussion period. It wasn't a sermon. Then the priest would say the prayers. They break the bread. They pass the plate around, pass the cup around, and that was mass. So it was, it was, it was kind of eclectic going from as liberal a Roman mass as you could think of to as traditional a Byzantine liturgy when I came home as you could think of. Um, so I, I was in both camps and I guess that tension kept me balanced. I don't know. That, that, that's at how least I, you were I able to receive. It. Yeah. And, and was able to at least go to communion. And like I said, I got to know the priest and the nun as friends. Uh, I helped out with printing, typing the bulletins every Sunday. Uh, was on the parish council, so I I did a lot did a lot for the church even even in college. Yeah, I mean, so I've I've heard a lot of stories of these guitar masses and such. I've never never seen one. It feels like it's a it's a a make believe story, but you know I'm I wasn't there for uh, any of the new reforms. I guess. Uh, that happened. I've always been part of Vatican II. Uh, right. So, I mean, it was, it was really like that for you at the oh, yeah. at U of R? It was, you know, I, I showed up at, at school and, and uh, went to the first the first mass, every mass that the Newman community, you know, Newman was the, that back then they called them the Newman Club or Newman Community. It was the Roman Catholic students on campus we had our own full-time chaplain and I went to the first one and it kind of blew me away. You know, there were four or five students up front with guitars and they were accompanying the music instead of an organ. I I can't imagine that. I've only seen videos. Yeah. And every, and every mass was the same. There wasn't, a, you know, the liberal mass, you know, the guitar mass and a regular one. It was, everything was that because they were trying to appeal to, you know, the, the college students, and that was the big thing for college kids back then was, you know, to have that sort of liberal um, approach, you know, trying to appeal to the people. Um, but uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't for me. And as soon as I got out of school and graduated and came here to Washington to work, I found the closest church I could, which is here in Virginia. And 
uh, joined it, been active in it, uh, and they sort of say the rest is history. So, so you that's said, how I started in all this. You said that when uh, you would bring a, a Byzantine priest uh, once a year to do that, what was the uh, what was the effect on the student life with that? Do you think you like really started the Eastern movement in Rochester, New York? Uh, I don't. I wouldn't say it's a movement, but I. I certainly. I think opened their eyes to the fact that the church is bigger than just the Roman Catholic right and the the Roman Catholic Church that they grew up with. Uh, and so, uh, I guess you know when I look back and reflect on the rest of my life since then, you know I I graduated now almost fifty years ago from college. My high school reunion of fifty years was last year. Uh, I graduated high school in 1972, so 22 was the 50th, and I missed it. Um, but, um, you know, I think I I at least opened up the eyes of my fellow students at, at school to the fact that there was an Eastern Catholic Church and what it was like and what some of our, you know, how we were the same faith, but just the different practices. Did it take uh, place in the Newman Center? or uh, Well, we didn't have a Newman Center. They're just now trying to build one 50 years later. They've had a Newman community for many, many, well, since when I was there before that. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I'm so used to the Newman Center being a thing now. What I meant yeah. by that was wherever you were meeting in the Newman clubs, was it held there or was it yeah. like in a different auditorium or? Yeah. Actually, actually, the University of Rochester uh, was blessed in that there was a uh, a family that owned the department stores of Rochester called the McCurdy's. And they donated um, uh, a good sizable amount and they built on campus uh, a building called the Interfaith Chapel. And so from the very beginning of uh, the, you know, the growth of the campus from its early years when it was founded in the middle of the 1900s, uh, it, it's had an interfaith component and space for uh, all the different faiths. Uh, and it was back in those days, I don't know if they still keep to this, uh, there were three levels and the three major faith traditions were sort of allocated a worship space on each level. Uh, so up on the top level, uh, the big domed uh, worship area was used by the Protestants. They were the largest component at that time. The middle level had a special place with a Torah. Uh, and so the Jewish community met there. And then the lowest level, which actually was down on the riverbank of the Genesee River, uh, was for the Catholics. And there were three alcoves and a, a center space. And that, yeah, that was where we had our mass uh, was on, on the lower level. And that's where we had the Byzantine liturgy was uh, down on that same level. So it was a proper interfaith chapel. I'm used to yeah, thinking yeah. Of, uh, thinking of them from like the airport where it's just like, here's a little room and here's some water that you might think is holy water. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, right, right. The, the, other, the other thing that a uh, little story about, about me having a liturgy there, uh, the priest that I brought in was a, a friend of, the, of my pastor's family. Um, Father Mike Shear, a blessed memory, he came in from, from Harrisburg. But in order to create a Byzantine worship space, uh, early in the school year, I asked my father back in Pittsburgh, who was an artist and architect, to paint me icons that were full length, full size uh, on canvas that I could roll up and put into my car and then hang at one of the alcoves to create an icon screen and an altar area and a nave. And he did. And I still have those canvas painted icons to this day. We used them for the 25th anniversary of my parish because we couldn't fit into our, our one building. Uh, I modeled on wood and used them. I've used them mounted on wood to hold Oriental Illumin Conference liturgies in the Basilica downtown and create the you know uh, sort of an icon screen and then uh, for the liturgy uh, at Rochester 
I didn't have the wooden frames. We just hung them from the ceiling with a wooden bar across the bottom to hold them down. But they were kind of, you know, loose. They were just hanging. They were about eight feet tall. And uh, when the priest would walk through the deacon doors with the gifts, the cloth would move just a little bit, and it and it looked like the Holy Spirit, the wind was moving through uh, along with him. So it it had a little bit of a mystical feel to it. A little uh, a little charismatic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, a, <laughs> a little, little charismatic, charismatic flair. Right, right. Um, oh my goodness. That that was that was my debut as a cantor. I had chanted the epistles since I was in high school, uh, and I don't have a great voice, but I have one, a voice that projects. Um, and so uh, I got the little music books out that we had, and I taught myself how to follow on the organ the melody line to keep myself in tune. And so, unfortunately. Back in those days, we didn't have video cameras or iPhones like we have today, so I don't have a recording of it. But I led 100 students in the Byzantine liturgy of sitting at the organ and singing from, from the music book myself. You don't think there's a sing there wasn't a single person who had some form of camera for that? No, well, not, no not in those days. Not certainly for video. We might have had some still pictures taken, but... Uh, in the 1970s, you know, uh, that was that even predated digital video. You had to have a beta um, camera in order to record on your own. And those were pretty, you know, those ran a thousand bucks. They were not. Uh, cheap. Yeah, I mean, I guess college students wouldn't have those. No, no, no. Now, Rochester students were pretty well off because a lot of them came from the city and, uh, they had lots of money, but they didn't put them into cameras. They put them into cars and furnishings for their you know, dorms and and that sort of thing. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. But you let you had over a hundred students just yeah. there for the yeah, liturgy for the, for the uh, and we had it in the evening. Uh, it was not a uh, not a regular Sunday liturgy. It was just it was almost like a which is concert. even more. That that's Sorry? honestly that is honestly more amazing that you're you're telling me it's an evening. It, yep. you, it wasn't Sunday or it was Sunday. No, it wasn't even a Sunday. It was a weekend. And you had a hundred kids. Just yep. you know, I want to see the Byzantine liturgy. What was what was yep. the uh what was re the response from that? Like what was how did they react? What what, what did they say? It was pretty po yeah, it was pretty positive. I mean, I think after that everyone um that I can recall, you know, had a new respect for me that, you know, I, I practiced my Catholicism in a way that was very different than the way they did. Um, and like I said, uh, that was my, you know, first attempt, I guess it's been built into my DNA ever since of trying to educate people about what my religion's all about and how it's the same and how it's the different, how it's different. And that the sameness is more important than the differences, and that's kind of the uh, mantra, if you will, of how I've been trying to bring the Catholics and Orthodox together uh, at the highest levels of the church. It comes from that basic uh, feeling I, I've had my whole life that manifested at that time back in, in at the university. Yeah, uh, I, I do. And, and, yeah, we had a hundred kids show up. Uh, they all because because the Ruthenian liturgy. Once you get to know the Lord have mercy and the amen and all that sort of stuff. It's pretty easy to follow along. And so by the end of the liturgy, everyone was singing with, you know, pretty good gusto. And when you sing with gusto like that, you come away feeling, you know, energized. And like, you, I'd like to, I like to use the phrase, when I go to a Byzantine liturgy, I feel like I've been to church. Did you take any of the, uh, the Roman, the Latin elk into the east. No, I don't. I don't think so. Switch rice. You know the. You know we didn't have a priest within a hundred miles. I didn't have a parish to take them to. I wasn't going to take them to the Ukrainians, um, and uh, so you know I didn't convert anyone, and I lost touch with them when I when I graduated college and moved to Washington. I lost touch with all those people, 
Um, and so uh, there's not been any follow on or, or anything. So um, and, and that's not what I try to do. You know, I don't try to convert people. I just try to yeah, educate I'll, them about I'm not even talking you know, like that. It's just because yeah. like I'll go to Byzantine liturgies and I'll be there. And I'll meet a whole bunch of people who were at one point Latin right and then discovered the Eastern and then were just like, this is where I wanted to go. So I wasn't asking, yeah. like, did you convert anybody? Did you, like, convince them to be Eastern? But, like, because the Divine Liturgy is beautiful. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I'm Latin right, but over there in my prayer corner, I have the Byzantine Liturgy prayer book that I will, you know, do. Uh, mm -hmm. so it, it, this is why I was wondering and and you just yeah. you mentioned briefly this is why the the reaction you got is why you started uh working in and having the Oriental Lumen Foundation I, I I I wouldn't go so far as to say it's why I I my comment was more you know I was doing it back then just because I was doing it I had no rhyme or reason or purpose and I, it was just an early indication of what I'm doing now on a larger scale and at a higher level. God, it's just educating like, people as to who we are as, as, as Byzantine Catholics. God is kind of just like giving you a little spark of what's to come. Share the. Yeah, I was working yesterday uh, on editing the transcripts of the book I'm, I'm about to publish as a tribute to Metropolitan Callistos of Diocleia, who I worked with. Uh, a lot over the last 30 years for Oriental Illumin and a whole bunch of other things, including the many videos that we're going that we're now using and will continue to use in our podcast. Um, and I found um, his introductory comments when he received the Ecumenism Award at Catholic University about 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, he, he he gives a short intro uh, of you know, that he's so pleased to be there uh, because uh, I invited him and I arranged to get for him to get the award. And, and he goes on and uses a phrase that I'd forgotten about since then, uh, the term, the Greek term, anaki or ananki, which is which means your um, uh, destiny. And uh, he commented that it was my destiny to bring the Eastern and Western churches together. And that uh, the unique part of Oriental Illumin that Calistos liked the most was the fact that the Eastern Catholics were, were there uh, and that he could talk to them because he, he says, quote, unquote, they are our closest brothers. Yes. Um, I'd forgotten he said all those, those nice things and it was nice to read them again. <laughs> he was a... Uh... He was telling you you're gonna do what the the Zogby initiative couldn't. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Could you could say that? I I had to throw that in. I I just recently found out that it was a thing, and I was like, oh, all right, oh, sounds yeah. like it. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, I published it as a book way back when. The the you published the Zogby initiative or? Yep. yep. I'm assuming it's on yep. EC pubs. Yeah, yeah. If you go to EC Pub's website and do a search on the name Zogby, uh, you should come up. It's a thin book; it's not very long, um, and I forget all the contents of it. But when the Zogby Initiative kind of came out, the priest uh, who founded Eastern Church's Journal and Eastern Christian Publications with me, Father Serge Kelleher, told me that we should publish his initiative and backup material that went with it, and the response from the Orthodox because it was going to be a valuable, important book. And I did. And uh, we don't sell very many because not many people know about it. But yeah, we, we published the Zogby Initiative back in the 90s when it first came out. Do you think of yourself as like continuing that or not? Because <laughs> I mean, it is kind well, of it is kind of the, the goal of Orientale Lumen Foundation to uh, bring the the Catholic and Orthodox churches together. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's our, that's our goal. The other, the, the, the other thing that's different about Oriental Illumin in, in the broader sense is, uh, and Patriarch Bartholomew, uh, the ecumenical patriarch in Constantinople actually said this to us, the first conference we had there, 
he came and greeted us and welcomed us uh, was he said, uh, um, your activities are a grassroots movement of ecumenism as opposed to being experts and theologians from the top down. Oriental Illumin is lay people and diocesan clergy getting together just for the love of unity and the love of the church and
Um, Nicholas Elko was a, one of the fathers at Vatican II, and he had his priests back in Pittsburgh hurry up and, and produce an English version of the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom that he celebrated in Rome in St. Peter's at the close of Vatican II. Uh, that's amazing. And so from the 60s onward, we had an English and a church Salonic. And there was, you know, I wouldn't say a battle, but there was always this tension um, between the two. And when I was growing up in the late 60s and into the 70s, uh, we would have the early morning uh, low mass or shortened form, which was in English, and then the high mass or the longer form in church Salonic. And the point I was trying to make was because I like to sing and one of my grandfathers was a great tenor. Uh, he would always, when I was not serving as, on the altar as an altar server, he would take me to the high, the high mass, the church Salonic liturgy, just so I could sing with them. Uh, and so I grew up learning the church Salonic in my head without books uh, ever since I was in junior high school. That That's amazing. I'm, Again, this is this is all new to me. Uh so this is maybe I maybe I'm the perfect guy to talk about this. Nobody know I don't know, and probably most of the people who are listening didn't know about that. I mean, yeah, I yeah. I talk to a lot of Eastern Catholics. I know a lot of Eastern Christians in general, but this is that's totally new to me. Yeah, and well so you that, 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 I think that comes from, you know, a lot of the Eastern Catholics uh, are third and fourth generation or they're converts like yourself. Uh, yeah. Whereas there's very, very few of us born and raised in the church who know of or remember those sorts of things. Um, yeah. So in the course of our conversations, there may be a lot more stories that uh, I can bring out of interesting little anecdotes of the history of the Ruthenian church. So I'm just like, like for instance, we go back, you you were telling you you mentioned that you brought in the divine liturgy to uh U of R, the the beautiful story of the basically the wind doing that. I was under the impression that this was just, you know, what had always been for the Eastern Catholics. It's always been in the vernacular, but I'm just like, oh wait, no, this was new, period. Because how long prior? Was that that was, yeah, yeah. It just yeah. it just well, recolors so much about yeah. history. Well, in fact, in fact, uh, just this past week from the printer, uh, I received the copies, the paperback version of a small little prayer book. It's hard to hard to see in black, uh, but this is the title page. How do you and say so that? It, it says. My little prayer book, Moi Mali Molik Venik, which is a little translation, My Little Prayer Book. This was the prayer book published in 1945 for children when they received First Holy Communion and went to confession because it has an examination of conscience in it. It has the Ten Commandments in it, and it has the Divine Liturgy in it, and it's dual language, English and Slavonic, side by side. Oh, wait, right, because didn't... Uh... The reform also get, that is absolutely beautiful. I'm probably going to buy it now. Uh, <laughs> but also, the reform made you go back to more Eastern tradition. Uh, Late, yeah, later reforms did. This one did not. No, that that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about Vatican II reform. Because uh, that you just said the kids would have that for when they receive communion but now just like in the orthodox church receive as infants that's right that's right but you're and saying so, that they would have that when they can uh receive so that that implies that at one point they weren't receiving as infants well, yeah and in fact i grew up receiving or having a first communion in the 60s 19, 1962 is when I turned eight. And so, yeah, up, in, up until the 90s, uh, we had, it, uh, you know, First Holy Communion. And we have slowly, from the 90s till today, been 
restoring the notion of infant communion uh, in our churches to go back to our original tradition. And that's and that reform has come about because of a document issued by the Vatican, yep. um, by the Congregation of Eastern Churches called, you know, liturgical principles and a big long long word that I've also published. It came out in the 90s that essentially told all the Eastern Catholic churches to restore their original Eastern traditions and remove quote unquote Latinizations. So does um, your church still have pews or has it removed those too? No, we, we still have pews, uh, but we don't have an altar rail. The church I grew up still has the altar rail. Does anybody use it? Uh, and it uh, I, I don't know what they use, but um, but more significantly, the church I grew up with in St. Peter and Paul in Duquesne, I think is the largest physical building in the whole metropolia, seats 800 people, even more than the cathedral, um, and it has no icon screen. All right, that that's. I'm looking that up, and I'm putting it oh, yeah. so people can see it. Yeah, yeah, Saint Peter and Paul and Duquesne. They have a huge uh, altar area with a huge Western-style altar on three steps and a baldacchino on four pillars that go up above it, and it's all marble with three tall candlesticks on each side, uh, and this huge... Is there anything Eastern? I'm sorry? <laughs> that just sounds like my parish down the road. Is there? Was there anything Eastern? Yeah, the, the, the one thing that is Eastern that was there from the beginning is instead of an icon screen, what the priest did was he put beautiful mosaics of icons into the walls across the front of the church. So that's the symbolic icon screen. Um, but there's no deacon doors, there's no royal doors, there's no screen in front of the altar, uh, the, you know, at all. And that's, um, that's just how you grew up. And so what was- And that's how I grew up, that was the church I came from. And uh, they, you know, the, the parish and the priest there have never sort of uh, had the either the finances or the will to renovate the church to make it more Eastern the way it should be. So that's how you grew up. And obviously at some point before you went off to college, you had to have seen that's how it was. So what was your, what was your first experience with the, the parish actually looking Eastern like? Uh, well, that church was, built when I made First Communion. In fact, my first communion class in 1962 was the first Holy Com the first time that we had a big celebration. Um, the old church where my parents were married and where I was baptized had a full screen icon okay. screen. Okay, a so you had seen it. And I'd seen it, you know, if, if I could remember back before I was seven. Uh, I, I remember it only through pictures. I don't have a mental picture of it. Um, but that's, that was the old church, St. Peter and Paul, down on First Street. And when they moved up the hill to a more modern uh, area of Duquesne, they wanted to modernize everything. And so they built this big, huge church and modernized it and left Eastern things out and so forth. And then, uh, but, but that was in the days in the 60s when our church was huge. My parish, where I grew up, when I made, when I quote unquote made or received my first Holy Communion in second grade, there were forty kids in my class. That, so that's we had lot. forty, <laughs> well, forty second, forty second graders. You multiply that times, let's say, eight elementary classes. Uh, you know, you got three hundred children in catechetical education, which is probably from, you know, 500 families or over a thousand people in one parish. So obviously the Holy Spirit was there because to, to, to wrangle up that many kids and not have a massive problem uh, well, they, required the, the, the Holy Spirit. Well, in those days, you bring up an interesting idea I not thought of. Uh, in those days, our teachers were bazillion nuns with the real high stovepipe hats and all black 
you know, heavy vestments. Um, and uh, Sister Athanasius was our teacher for second grade. And she, yeah, she uh, she ruled with an iron fist and a strong uh, ruler on the knuckles uh, to the point where for the first Holy Communion procession into the church, uh, I had the distinct honor of being the shortest kid in class, so I was the very first one in the long procession going down this aisle that seemed to go forever. Because, like I said, the church, you know, had a capacity of for eight hundred people, and um, so the 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 uh, the main aisle was I I bet you a good hundred hundred and fifty feet long, you know, half a football field, um, and uh that was before they installed the carpeting the flooring was still linoleum tile and to give it some sort of you know pattern they uh had linoleum tiles of a different color every four tiles going all the way down the aisle and so the sister had a clicker that she would click in a regular rhythm and that was that when you got the click, that was the time to take a step off the tile and move forward. So the whole procession stayed without bunching up and stayed completely in order and spaced out and everything. And I was the first one. And the one thing I do visualize about my first experiences, I think that I can remember that church was leading that procession in and with a thousand people in the church and all my classmates behind me all the light bulbs going off because back in those days we had instamatic cameras with flash bulbs and it was like paparazzi you know mm -hmm. everyone's trying to grab a picture of their kid coming down the aisle and i was in front so i was getting all of them and the whole aisle erupted as we went uh walking up to the front of the church how will um, how are all of you not blind <laughs> i don't know but so yeah, so that was a new church. That's when that happened. It was a big celebration. What hap What happened to the old uh, church? Is, is there any divine liturgy happening that was oh, there? No. Or is it just uh, like no, the old, as building? soon as they moved from the old to the new, they had a big procession through the city and and carried the blessed sacrament. And the old church, uh, I don't I don't know the details, but it was sold off as just property and uh, eventually demolished and turned into apartment buildings or something like that. So. Yeah, the old church is long gone. Okay, that's that's sad. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I have pictures of it from my parents' wedding, from the better. inside. And 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 I have I also have in one of my photo albums my mother's first Holy Communion picture. And the, the tradition in those days was that the Holy Communion picture was taken on the front steps. Because in Duquesne, you had the steel mills next to the river on the flatland, and then the cities were on the hills all around. And so every property had a steep hill, including the church. And so, so there was 20 or 25 steps from the street up to the front door of the church. And it was on those steps where all the groups would come and take their pictures. And I have one from, I think, 1938. Uh, was when my mother made her first communion. And uh, I have a picture with with her circled on it uh, in black and white from from the, that, you know, it's almost 100 years ago now. Wow. So you got any other fun uh, stories from uh, from your childhood in any oh, capacity get, before I, we yeah, wrap up? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, I'll just wrap up with maybe a, the story of how uh, because of the size of the church, when I was in high school, um, we uh, for Holy Week services, we had 40 altar servers. And so uh, we worked in four-man teams. Uh, we'd have two younger boys with two older boys. The younger boys carried the torches, and the older boys were responsible for the incense. Um but when it came time for Holy Week, we had to have uh, rehearsals for two or three weeks ahead of time so that everyone knew what their role was. And it was almost like a like a, a uh, you know, a Broadway production 
of wrangling 40 junior high and high school boys uh, on a Saturday to go through the, the process of processions and so forth to get ready for a Good Friday procession with the shroud and then the procession for uh, the resurrection on uh, Holy Saturday night. Uh, back in those days, we, we had the old tradition uh, that the, there would be the, the midnight resurrection matins followed by liturgy, the way the Greeks do today. We did back then. Um, we don't do it so more, much anymore because of security. Uh, but yeah, uh, the story was, I rem- and, and I was in charge of the altar service when I was a senior in high school. So I was the one that was running all of these rehearsals uh, with my friends uh, to get them to learn what their role was and what they were supposed to do when it came time for Easter. Beautiful. Well, all right, then. I think that wraps up our time for today. Um, Stick with me, Jack. Uh, But as for everybody at home, uh, thank you for listening. Hope you enjoy Thursday's episode, and we'll see you again next week. Bye.